edition of the Gorilla Report. My name is Ollie Harper and we are back for another instalment of the latest professional wrestling talk show coming to you every single Friday night here on YouTube.com. Now this week guys we have got an, another absolutely tremendous show lined up because we have got the first part of a two part interview with an ECW original for all the way from Extreme Championship Wrestling. I'm talking about none other than C.W. Anderson. This gentleman is a veteran in the professional wrestling business of course competing in Japan, competing in ECW, TNA Wrestling. He had a bit of a time in the WWE under the new ECW. Talking about all of that in this amazing two-part interview. We're going to release part one to you tonight. And then part two is going to be next week. So keep your eyes peeled for that one, guys. Uh, also tonight, we're going to be showing you some future guests that are going to be coming up. In the remaining, well, in the remainder of season two of the Gorilla Report, I don't think you're going to believe who we've got. But uh, if you've not been following us on the Facebook page, this will come as quite a surprise to all of you. But so uh, we're going to be showing you who's coming to the Gorilla Report, or well, the remainder of season two. And also we've got the WWE news for tonight as well, as uh, WWE has been across the pond over here in the UK, and uh, I was very fortunate to go and check out Monday Night Raw this week with some friends at the Manchester Evening News Arena. Absolutely fantastic. We're going to talk about all of that on the WWE News portion of the show. But when we get back after this, guys, indeed, we are going to be doing the WWE News. We will be back in just a little bit. Alright guys, so it is now the WWE news portion of the show. Now this week of course WWE came across the pond to here in the United Kingdom and all over Europe of course for the winter European tour. Now of course Raw this week was taped and it was from the Manchester Evening News Arena. I was very fortunate to be there live to see it all happen. And uh, I'll tell you now, Raw was a very good show this week. I definitely think the crowd was very much into it. They always say that the UK crowds are some of the best in the world when it comes to wrestling. You know, we definitely know and we can definitely bring it every single time. You know, but uh, the Raw, you know, Raw itself, I felt was a very good show. Uh, the ending was absolutely tremendous when the Wyatt family and the Shield got into that in-ring confrontation. I would definitely feel that uh, the WWE was perhaps testing the waters on this one, and uh, if we do indeed get to see the Shield versus the Wyatt family at WrestleMania 30, I think that could be absolutely uh, tremendous. And uh, you know, if they were to do that match, my my feelings for this one would be for, I would definitely go more in terms of a loser disbands kind of deal. Now, you know, the, the Shield have been built up for the last sort of year and a bit. They could definitely then break up and uh, you could just, you know, keep the Wyatt family around and just keep them moving, for, you know, going forward. I think, I, I definitely would think that that would be the best way to, uh, you know, to develop all the guys in that match. But uh, other news to mention this week, of course, the uh, we're going to be getting to see John Cena versus Alberto Del Rio rematch. The World Heavyweight Championship on the line at Survivor Series. Uh, I would definitely want to see uh, John Cena go over in this one. I feel that with Cena regaining the World Heavyweight Championship at Hell in a Cell, he has definitely brought some credibility and importance back to the World Heavyweight Championship. The world title has been, I feel it's lost, it definitely lost a lot of, uh, of credibility throughout the last couple of months when it was just being passed around every upper mid card guy going. Now, I think when you've got a solid guy like John Cena carrying the belt, it's uh, definitely getting, it just feels like this belt's got more of a significance in the WWE, you know, and I'm, I'm definitely digging that. Now, if uh, Cena was to keep the belt till 30, and then we did get this this rumoured champion versus champion match, I'd be pretty happy with that, definitely. Uh, but other news to mention this week, of course, Triple H and Stephanie McMahon were on holiday, supposedly, and what they decided to do was have Corporate Kane 
show his power in the WWE with uh, him coming out and making matches and whatnot. Now with Corporate Kane, like I said last week, Kane is a guy that I feel you know he's very much up for anything at this type of you know in this time in his career, and uh, where they're going with Kane right now with the corporate Kane and the suit and stuff, I think is definitely very interesting and a different side to the Big Red Monster. Now, of course, he did an interview, I believe, in the midweek on WWE.com with Michael Cole, and again, you know how he conducted the interview, saying you know. You're going to get to see this uh, this violent streak can always return. And you know, he's very, very good at what he does. Kane, I think, is one of these guys that's very, very underrated in a lot of ways. I think this guy is still very, very good uh, as a speaker, as as much in the ring. I think he can do a damn good job, but uh, that's just my, you know, my opinion. But uh, anything else to mention this week, WWE news-wise? Of course, Randy Orton got a uh, choke slam to hell. Through the announce table, of course, the Big Show returning the favour after Big Show had been uh, slammed the week prior. Uh, you know what? This this Big Show Randy Orton thing. I don't want to. I do not want to see this go uh, any further than Survivor Series. I think that with this feud, it's more about just probably keeping Daniel Bryan, you know, at bay for a few months to keep you know to develop the Wyatts, and then they can bring Daniel Bryan back up to the mix. Uh, around rumble time that's what i would hope for but uh you know that's about everything for this uh, for this double well, for the wwe news portion of the show and when we get back after this we are going to be doing the big interview with none other than ecw original cw anderson he joins me next on the grill report for part one we will be back in just a little bit <laughs> We are now back on the Gorilla Report, and I'm now joined by a gentleman who is without a doubt a world traveller. This man was a part of the original Land of Extreme, Paul E. Heyman's ECW. This gentleman has been in hardcore matches, he has been in Japan, he has been all over the world, and, and in two days' time he is going to be wrestling Matt Hardy. I am joined by none other than C.W. Anderson. Welcome to the Gorilla Report. Um, thanks for having me, Ali. Not a problem, not a problem. I just want to say thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your day for coming on the show. Now, with any interview that I always do, I like to start off with the uh, early growing up. How was growing up for you? Um, I live in a little community and outside of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, I grew horse group on a horse farm. And my brother, it was just me and my brother, my mom and dad. And... I uh, kind of grew up hard. Uh, in my in my era, or when I grew up, you you worked all the time, so you didn't sit around and play games like kids do nowadays. You actually went out and worked. So, um, grew up hard, played hard when I did get to play, and grew up. Uh, uh, I wasn't a fan of wrestling when I grew up. My brother was the one that actually got me turned on to it. So it, it wasn't until. I was 12, 13 years old, and I became a fan of the NWA National Wrestling Alliance, where Ric Flair and Dusty Rhodes, Midnight Express, Rock and Roll Express, those names kind of hit home and started watching them, and I still wasn't in love with the business like some guys that grew up, all they ever wanted to be was professional wrestler. That wasn't me. If anybody's seen my interviews, known my interviews, uh, read my Wikipedia, they knew I was drafted to play Major League Baseball at a high school as a very gifted catcher. Um, still play ball to the day, not baseball, because uh, my knees can't take it, of course, but um, still play. And, of course, at 42-year-olds, I'm still wrestling. And there you go, there you go, and that's 
and that's a very cool thing, you know, 42 year old, you're still doing it, you're still doing what you love, yep. and of course he's saying in two days time you're going to be facing Matt Hardy, of course you're doing a lot mm -hmm. of uh, the, uh, ext well, you're still doing a lot of the extreme reunion shows throughout the, uh, the yep. months whenever you get given these, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, so yep. of course with your early training, let's talk about your early training uh, getting into the business, if uh, we can. Okay. And uh, if everybody's watching, you got to understand that if breathing gets a little bit shaky, as Ollie and I tried doing it on my tablet yesterday, I haven't upgraded my computer when it has webcam, so now we're kind of doing it on my phone, so it's kind of, it's a little bit, as you say, shaky right now. Um, yeah, you say you want me to talk about my training, correct? Yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, when I broke into the business, it was kind of by mistake. Uh, after playing baseball and blowing out my throwing arm, I was looking something to do on the weekends because I always play ball on the weekends, and... I saw a buddy of mine at uh, McDonald's, yeah. and he was doing the weekend indie wrestling thing that everybody does now. And um, asked him what he was doing. He told me. He said, "Hey, would you come to the show with me? I know you like wrestling. You know, we were friends growing up." He said, "If uh, you get, we get there early, I'll get you in the ring." And we kind of did and rolled around and kind of got hooked. Yeah. I never got formally trained for like five, six years. I kind of learned as I went. I ended up tagging, you know, becoming an Anderson, and we'll get in. You know, we'll talk about that story, but. Ended up just learning on the fly, and it wasn't until I got to the WCW power plant to where yeah. I got formally trained. Um, got the Anderson name my first night in the business. I was wrestling under Hood, and this was the time that Razor Ramon, Scott Hall, was popular, and they, a group called me, put me under Hood, and called me El Chico. I come up with a toothpick. I mean, it was it was looking back on it, it how Marcus the people were, you know, to make me do something like that. But I didn't know any better. I wasn't trained right, and. Um, the guys that were doing the Andersons named the you know the famous Andersons, Ole Arn and then Gene, who's really the only real Anderson. Um, they got permission from him, sat me down, talked to me, and I had a good tea at the time. And want to know if I wanted to become an Anderson because one of the brothers that was tagging was actually retiring. He was you know what my age is now at the time when I was twenty three, and he said that you know that he wanted a brother, so to speak, to run up and down the East Coast with the East Coast of the United States. Yeah. And I said, sure, why not? Uh, my real name's Chris Wright. So he said, let's try to come up with a three-letter name because his name was Pat. You had Ole, you had Arn. And for like two weeks, I couldn't come up with anything. I couldn't come up with a name or anything. And my baseball coach that would turn out to be a manager, we were sitting out one night talking. I told him, you know, I'm wrestling this weekend. I can't come up with anything. He said, well, we'll just use your initials and call you CW. And it just, yeah. it just stuck. And, um, Started running up and down the East Coast with uh, my partner. Got to you know known as a really good tag team, and the group that I'm wrestling for this weekend, Omega, yeah. is one of the groups I, I wrestle with. And we all, you know, all of us started together in kind of a reunion. And I, I do this in every, I say it in every interview. The group I started with is the largest group of wrestlers to ever make it famous. I think there's like 15 of us that oh, started yeah. together. Yeah. Here in the area of Raleigh, North Carolina, of and Matt and Jeff Hardy, you had Hurricane Helms, yeah. myself, Steve Carino, yeah. who's my you know, close personal friend, uh, Joey Matthews, who was Joey Mercury, he was Joey Matthews with us at ECW, Christian York, uh, Mike Howe, Otto Schwantz, who were the Ducks that did us ECW. Um, let's see, Christian York, Joey Matthews, Joey Ab, yeah. we called him Venom, Jason Arndt, uh, uh, Brad Kane, who was Lodi, then you had Kurt. Curtis White, who did a little bit of the Unnamed Toad with PG-13. Um, God, who else am I forgetting? Uh, Shannon Moore. Shannon Moore, yes. yes. Yeah. Shannon Moore was the youngest of us. Yeah. And he, he all started, so... Um, oh, excuse me one second. Hello. My wife just walked in, sorry. Um, anyway, uh, there, it was like 15, 16 of us. But anyway, uh, we all wrestled together. You know, we traveled. We did a Southern Championship Wrestling. We did a Mega... And we were a close knit group, man. We were one of these that we need. We always wanted to see who can, you know. We were all born to make it, and we were all thriving, and yeah. you know, hoping that everybody would make it. And Matt and Jeff had they were doing jobs for W for WWE at the time or WWF, and we knew that they were. We thought they were going to be the ones that made it because they had the look, they had the talent, and um, it seemed like every show, every one of us got better because we were wrestling each other every night and. We were doing bar shows where we were putting two or three hundred people in a bar that would maybe hold a hundred. And these people were getting paying five bucks to watch all of us wrestle. Now I just think if we do those shows with all of us back again, how much it will cost. Yeah. So it was it was fun for like five or six years riding up and down the road with these guys, you know, being close and then seeing Matt and Jeff go off to WWE and, and Venom or Joey Ab going off and then Lodi being Raven's sign guy and then Steve and I 
you know, but going to the land of extreme, yeah, um, yeah, it was something to, for all of us. And, you know, Shane Helms at WCW and Shannon Moore, and then them going to WWE, uh, it was really cool. And it's great seeing them again, like, you know, this weekend. I'll see Matt, um, I'll see Shane Helms and a bunch of guys that we started. It's, it's good to be able to reunite. And, and you know, Ollie, that's really fun to still wrestle it, you know, 42 is yeah. to see those guys that I started with. They're kind of old my family. They're like your family, absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. and that's a very nice thing to, to know that you know you built these bridges in your early career, and mm -hmm. you know you're you're able to you know keep in touch with these guys, and you know they've all you've all gone off and you've lived your dream in a lot of ways. You know you've all gone off and become successful professional wrestlers. You've all been on TV, and you know it's nice that it's a humbling thing that you can all still get together and do these smaller shows in the area and stuff. So. Uh, that is, that is definitely tremendous. So, I want to say, we're twitching on, of course, the Anderson thing, you know, becoming an Anderson and all that. How was it, how did you feel when you were being told you were being brought into such a, affiliated with such a, a legendary wrestling family? How, how did you feel? At the, at the time, growing up, I wasn't an Anderson fan. You know, Andersons were the heels around here, and I wasn't a, a, that big of a fan. I was more of a Dusty Rhodes, Midnight Express fan. Yeah. Uh, huge, huge Bobby Eaton mark. Even to the day when I see Bobby, um, you know, I still remember stuff. And I always, I always told Bobby, once I got to know him like I do now, that, you know, he was an inspiration for me to get into wrestling. And um, I didn't really become a mark and a fan for Orn until I became an Anderson yeah. And started watching his work, and started working, working to you know see him as a technician. And after ECW, and then I went to Japan, and I was doing little dark shows for WWE. There was a few times that when Arn, you know, Arn was an agent, he would get me in the ring and work with me in the ring. Yeah. And that was really cool to Arn, you know, because Arn knew I was an Anderson. He knew I did the Anderson thing when I got to ECW. Uh, Paul Heyman called him and they talked about him, and it was Arn's blessing that they gave me the Enforcer moniker. Um, so that was humbling, you know, to, for Arn to do that for me. And then we we sat and talked, and I remember him telling me one time that he was kind of put me under his wing because, you know, he said us Anderson's got to stick together. Um, so it wasn't until like a few years later, and once I got to, literally once I got to WCW, that I realized, you know, holy crap, what of a, a legacy I'm carrying. And I did an interview one time with, um, uh, God knows I'm, his name, his name, his name, Storm, like he's, he's, he's a, uh, interview guy that does radio interviews and stuff and he did it for, and he said you know what is it like people comparing you to Arn they're comparing you to Arn they're comparing you to Ole being the next Anderson and I said you know people always said that what does it feel like walking in Arn Anderson's shoes and I always, yeah. and I always tell them I, I don't walk in Arn because I brought my home yeah exactly exactly you you know you it's I mean in a lot of ways I bet you were feeling quite in a humble place that you know you're being compared to a legend like Arn Anderson but mm -hmm. end of the day you're CW Anderson and you're a you're out to set your standard. And you're out to set your 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 bar. You know, you're out to set your bar in the yeah. business. So that's definitely. I, I, I think I, I think I have in some ways. You know, I, I, Shane Helms, who's a very straight, straight shooter, he's always he's never BS, and I've worked him a few times. And you know, Shane and I not only know each other in the business. He was my brother's best friend growing up. Yeah. So I've literally known Shane since you know they were little. And um, he told me not too long ago that. You know, he said, T.W., I'm, I've been in the ring with the best, and, and I've heard this on numerous times, but you never put too much into it until Shane told me. He said, you are by far the most underrated wrestler in the history of this business. Absolutely. He said, you're still one of the best, and, and it's, it's, it's great hearing it from Shane and when other people are telling you that too, but uh, I think that's the mark. I, I'm left and still leaving that. Yeah. I never got my just dues and didn't get it at WWE, but... I get in the ring with Shane Helms, and this weekend with Matt Hardy. Last weekend I wrestled Tommy Dreamer in another I Quit match, and I can I can still go at my age and still hold on with the best of them. Well, I just want to say, I want to talk about, of course, you say, Tushy, you was talking about WCW and, of course, the the WCW power plan. Now, of course, the WCW power plan, a place that has, you know, brought, you know, morphed a lot of the guys. It was very much like their training facility back in the day, of course. A lot of guys that were really morphed down there. I mean, hell, even Gold, I mean, Gold, Goldberg was down there. There's a few guys. Um, with the WCW power plan, now, there was a thing about that that you decided not to go after the power plant to the main company. Do you want to talk about that? Well, I went through, if, if anybody that's watching that doesn't know what they're talking about, about the power plant, if you go and look at their tryout, this YouTube WCW power plant tryout, and it was three days of hell. It's the worst thing I've ever gone through. Yeah. Um, even when I was a sheriff a few 
we were, you know, sheriff's officer not too long ago. We got the OC spray, which is was excruciating, but um, it's still the worst thing I've gone through in three days. And they said if I had to go through it again to make a million dollars, I'd go work at McDonald's. It's not worth it. Um, I went through 1998, and it was about the time when it was when Goldberg started making his comment. I was, there was times that he'd come in and train with Sergeant, Sergeant B. Lee, Buddy Lee Parker, and they'd run us outside, you know, and run us. But yeah. So he would be in there and watch him train to, to see how new to the business Goldberg was. Um, I was already wrestling, so I was kind of a step ahead in the other guys, but it wasn't until Sergeant Buddy Lee Parker and the late great Pat Swatley and Mike Winter got their hands on me and molded me into the wrestler that people saw at ECW. And I, I've always attributed that to SARS, and I even told them that, you're the reason that who I am today. Yeah. I would, my best friend at the time, Curtis White, who was again, he did some stuff at the end of WCW with uh, PG-13, they called him Toad. Yeah. Uh, he, he wrestled with me every week, and it was, it, was, it was us two against each other. And we would videotape our matches and bring them to Sarge and let him critique it from us, and he would just destroy and tear us apart as, Things and the one of the things I even tell my students today, I'm not going to tell you what you did right. I'm telling you what you did wrong. Yeah. And I'm very hard. And all last weekend at a show, I really laid into six guys. And you know, I still care about this business. Twenty years in the business, I'm still passionate about it. And that's how sorry it was. He instilled that in me. Yeah. But the way he molded me and the, the training, I would go three days every other week because I was still working a regular job, and he would train me. And that was the time the National Born Thrillers were getting trained, guys like that. And these guys are on six-figure contracts, um, and I can't even get a break. Uh, they're doing dark matches, stuff for, for Thunder and their TV tapes. I can't even give a break. It got to a point, it got so bad that SARS was so swamped yeah. that he would put me in the, another ring and send those guys, Elix Skipper, um, Chuck Palumbo, my, uh, Mike Sanders, Lash Root, and let me train them. And I'm sitting here training guys, and they're on contract. And that was very, very frustrating. And yeah. At the end, at the end, they JJ Dillon and Paul Warndorf came in to see what the power plant had. Of course, they had no idea. They paired us up and let us and watched us work. Well, I got paired with Toad, and we put on a match that Brad Armstrong called that should have been put at ECW at the time. You know, didn't know anything about going to ECW. He said that was an ECW style match, and when the, you're popping the boys and they're standing on their feet. You're doing something. And J.J. Dillon and Paul Ondorf pulled me to the side, and they said that, you know, you, you're, you're, you're wrestling okay, um, but you're not very marketable. We yeah. can't market oh. somebody like you because we're, we're not a wrestling company. We're marketing. Yeah. So and that was very disheartening. And even when they come and talk to me about offering me money, I was already fed up and past that point. So oh, I, I – yeah, it wasn't until it was a few weeks later when Toad had his tryout at ECW and I went down with him um, and got in the ring. Nova got me in the ring. Uh, it was just on a whim. Actually, Toad drug me down there. I was not going to go. I had just started seeing this new this new girl. I was all about her, so I was going to spend a weekend with her. And he's like, no. You know, we wrestled the great PG-13 right before that. And I was going to go back home and spend time with her. He's like, no, you're coming down here with me. He said, if you can't get in the ring, at least, you know, you can politic and meet the guy. So... He did his tryout, and it didn't go so well, and then Nova's looking at me and says, um, you, you got your gear, and I was like, well, yeah, it's in the car. So I ran and got it, got in, got in the ring with Simon Diamond. We did a little five-minute spot, got out of the ring, and he sort of asked, you know, he said, you got some good timing. And I hear Paul Heyman hollering at Bill Alfonso. I didn't know Paul Heyman was sitting there, and Paul's sitting there with uh, Taz and Bubba and Devon Dudley, and he tells Bill Alfonso to get the ball guy back in the ring. Yeah. So they, they put me in the ring for like the next hour, hour and a half. And I'm, they're interchanging different guys with me, and I'm bumping, I'm doing all kinds of things. And at the end of the, end of the, um, the session, the doors are open for the crowd, and I go in the back, and I'm sitting there, and I'm literally spitting up blood because I was bumping so hard. I was hitting the turnbuckle really hard to try and just impress those guys because they said if you can impress the ECW boys, you're doing something. Right. Um, because they, they see tryouts every weekend, and it wasn't until I got the ECW that I was seeing what they were talking about. But anyway. Yeah. I'm in the back, I'm cleaning up, and Paul Heyman walks back in the bathroom and walks straight up to me, sticks out his head, and says, hey, I'm Paul Heyman, it's nice to meet you. And I'm kind of a little nervous and apprehensive. I shake his hand, I say, hey, Paul, I'm Chris Wright. He said, Chris, where are you wrestling at now? I said, well, I'm at WC David Power Plant. Yeah. And um, he said, are they got you on contract? I said, no, sir, they haven't really offered me anything. They tell me I had any kind of look for it. You know, they're not having put anything on paper yet. He said, well, what's your wrestling name? And I told him C.W. Anderson, and he said, I knew it. He said, you look like Arn. You have this fine buster yeah. like Arn. You got the left punt. Yeah. He's 
to him. And he goes, don't leave before I speak to you at the end of the night. I said, yes, sir. So he said, feel free to stay in the back. So I stayed behind the curtain talking to some of the guys. And Jim Molyneux comes up to me and says, are you CW? I said, yes, sir. He said, Paul wants to see you in the back. So I walk in the locker room, and he's sitting there with Danny Dorn, Roke Hill, and Vito LaGrasso. Yeah. Introducing me to all three guys. Says, you're tagging with Vito. Third match. Welcome to ECW. Wow. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah. And he made, <laughs> I'll never forget, he made Danny and um, RK hit three finishes on the pin me that night. That was yeah. kind of his, like, flavor of the month. Wow. And, yeah. you know, Danny and Rokio are really good friends of mine, and people were telling me that they got kind of hot because of this new guy who's he to get pinned with three finishes. But they always said they never did. They didn't really care. But um, I never liked tagging with Vito LaGrasso. Mm-hmm. So, um, but, yeah, that's how I kind of got went from WCW to yeah. turning them down. Yeah. Because once I got the, once I got the offer at ECW, there was no way I was going back to WCW. I, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, from the sounds of it, you know, you got WCW, you were in a, such a bad place at the power plant. You know, they were, they were mm-hmm. you know, so disrespectful to you. I mean, you're a guy. You're, you're there trying to break into the business. They turn around and say you're not marketable. And then you've got a guy like Paul Paul E. Heyman, who at the time, you know, he was running what the third, you know, the third best promotion going in the United States in Extreme yeah. Championship Wrestling. Hell, hell yeah, you're going to snap up an opportunity off Paul Heyman. You know, who yeah. wouldn't? You know, it's uh, you know definitely. Yeah, I've always, I've always said, and I've already Paul a genius at taking guys like myself, yeah. Danny Dorn, Roadkill, Chris Chetty. Sandman, Balls, Axel, yeah. that are not marketable anywhere else and making them superstars. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, right. I mean, people don't know that, you know, Balls and Axel can, can wrestle, or they can wrestle. I didn't know that until I got in the ring with them. They can go. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I and mean, that's what they were saying. They always say ECW is the land of the misfits. They've always said that. It's it worked. Been, it's always been said, and it's uh, it's proven time and time again. And with that little story, you know, it's it's the place that where, you know, none of the other promotions wanted you guys, but you are, like, talented, talented guys, and Paul... Got you all in one under one roof. <laughs> yeah, we're in a land, land of misfit toys. That's the one. That's the one. So, so let's move on that. Say, let's talk about ECW and your experiences in the Extreme Championship Wrestling. So, ECW, you got there in 1999. I believe it was 99. 99 was my very was that debut match. There you go. So, 99 ECW. Um, so, let's talk about some of your uh, time working in ECW then. Uh, what would you like to know? Well, let's say let's talk about so let's talk about the first one. Let's talk about, of course, the hardcore style. Um, of course, ECW very much known for the hardcore style, the hardcore wrestling, the violence, the weapons. Um, you, yep. of course, were involved in quite a few of these matches while you were there. Um, let's have, one thing I'd love to talk about. Always wanted to ask a guy. You know, how do you get yourself really prepped up when you're you got you know you're going out there? You're going to be busting your ass with a guy. You're going to be using barbed wire. You're going to be using chairs. How do you get into that mindset, really? You, you don't. It's it, it's hard. You know, when I first started, I was petrified to work balls, Axel, New Jack, yeah. uh, Sandman, uh, who was the other one that I was, Sabu. Yeah. These guys, I'm watching them on TV, and they're, like, they're killing people. And I'm like, oh, my God. The first time I worked balls and Axel, I, could, I kept throwing up because I was so nervous. And <clears throat> in the beginning, it was... Once I started tagging with Bill Wild, um, and I started getting a little more comfortable there, yeah. that the way we got our hype, self hyped up, especially me, was I was always the first match. And to hear that ECW music hit, yeah. to let the fans know that it was starting, there was no greater drug at that time. Yeah. There, you could hit that, and you could have thrown me off the top of the bill, and I wouldn't have cared because, you know, we were working four days a week, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and. Hearing that music every night, knowing that ECW crowd that was always going to, you had to give them your A game every night because they were going to dump on you if you didn't. Yeah. I guess that's the way you prepare for it. And going in, the first time I worked balls and axle and you know, had to bleed and chair shots and things like that, I was really nervous. But once I got in front of the crowd, I just, you know, it's, it's what I do. It's what yeah. I, it's, I just did what I did. And I always dreaded taking a chair shot from balls. Um, because he hits you so freaking hard with it. Yeah. But other than that, it was that music and the crowd. You couldn't have given me a drug and nobody else that made you, you know, your adrenaline run like that. Yeah. 
I say I want to. Another thing I really want to talk about, of course, when you got into ECW, there was a lot of guys that were really jumping the ship, as you could say. I mean, let's first of all let's talk about the late Mike Awesome. Now, now Mike Awesome, he he created a lot of controversy, of course, at the time he was the ECW uh, heavyweight champion. I really wanted to talk about this. Now, you, of course, you were there at the time. Of course, he had to come back to defend the title, even though he jumped to WCW. Can you really remember, like, how how was it backstage when Awesome comes back? He's he's facing Taz, who was a WWF contracted wrestler. Right. Um, you were, I'm guessing you were there that night. Can you have you got any memories? I was, I was there that night. I, was, yeah. I, remember, I remember it. I remember. You say that like it was yesterday, but I remember JJ Dill, uh, JJ. What is his name? John Dill. Whatever the guy that was the security guard for WCW. He had Mike Awesome out in the car. They wouldn't let him in the back. They wouldn't let him in the arena until it comes time. Um, you can't blame a guy for wanting to make more money for his family if the way he went about doing it was wrong. Yeah. And he, everybody, it was like everybody wanted to kill him the, the way he went about doing it. And the thing I didn't like was took Taz, who was our supposed badass, yeah. and it took Taz and Tommy Dreamer to beat him. Yeah. So it just made us look less than what WCW was because it's taking two of our guys to beat one of theirs, so yeah. to speak. Um, Mike Awesome, very overrated. Yeah. Very over, overrated. I got in the ring with him, him and him, our heavyweight champ. I'm sitting here calling the match. And I'm a few months into ECW. I'm sitting here, I'm, you're a heavyweight champ. And you can't remember a freaking match. Um, you know, it's just his battles with Mas Masada Tanaka made him legendary. Yeah. Because his work to me, his work rate was never that great. He wasn't, he was just a kind of a big dude. That you know could take a punishment from Japan and again and stuff with and and I worked with Masato Tanaka you know fifty sixty times and it's all it, it's Tanaka that makes him look good it, it ain't him yeah yeah so I say so say talking about also with ECW what another thing I really want to talk about of course of course you've you've had your your experiences with it is of course blood in professional wrestling now. Uh, a guy, of course, Nigel McGuinness has been really fighting the cause to try and, you know, ban, you know, these blade jobs in professional wrestling. And of course, back then, you know, there was none of these like what we know now about the uh, having blood in professional wrestling and really the risk that, you know, you guys can be uh, can be having with 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 having blood in wrestling. What are your thoughts on people, you know, trying to take blood? I mean, of course, the WWE and another thing, of course, that. Uh, Chair shots to the head is another thing that the WWE doesn't allow anymore. And blood, another thing, blade jobs are a no-no. Uh, what are your thoughts really on all of this uh, in the current day? Blood, chair shots, all that is a part of wrestling. It's been a pro wrestling. You know, I guess you could say to me, Ric Flair made it, he made it famous, the blood part. I think people do it too much for lesser matches. You have to save that, just like the big stuff, for the big matches. And... I don't think it's going to stop. Um, just like there's going to be chair shots and people are going to be bleeding left and right, but I don't, I don't think the blood stuff's going to stop. And it's some go too far with it. Um, the older veterans, I mean, they're they're heads today, like your Ivan Koloff and Boogie Woogie Man by ass guys like that that I grew up watching, are just like you know sausages. It's all scarred up. New Jacks and balls and axles head the same way. Um, and of course, mine's not because of the times I did it, I didn't go. You don't have to go, you don't have to blade as deep as what some people think. You know, Steve Carino, he would get excessive with it, but that's what Steve became known for in ECW. Um, it's not going to stop. Do I have a problem? I'm the type of guy outside the ring, if I see somebody bleeding, it's a, I can't take it. Inside the ring, it doesn't really bar. Now, I've bled with Dreamer, I've bled with Carino, Balls and Axel. Um, being in there, it doesn't. I mean, I'm not going to sit there and let you drip all over my face or nothing like that, but uh, you it's, again, it's just part of wrestling, and yeah. this is. I've always say. I even tell my students that this is not ballet. You know, if you have such a problem with it, don't do it. Exactly, exactly. Now, uh, say, so touching going on back a little bit more on to ECW. Um, of course, the last ECW pay per view, Guilty as Charged, two thousand and one. Uh, of course, you worked a vicious hardcore match with a lot of blood involved against uh, the innovator of violence, Tommy Dreamer. Um, so working the I Quit match that night, have you got any real memories from the last ever pay per view? Really, from being from the gorilla position to the match, you know itself. You got any uh, memories you want to share? Yeah, from the gorilla. If we're gonna go from the gorilla position. Let's, the finish. Everybody, if you've seen the match, you've seen the finish. Tommy breaks puts me through the table and wraps the table around my face and pulls on and makes me say I quit. Yeah. It was supposed to be Bob. It was supposed to be Bob Ware that was supposed to wrap, and we couldn't. For some reason the Bob Ware got taken out of the truck. We couldn't find it. I had a hard time finding the ball bar, and we actually found some on a Chili Willy 
who is a student of mine, Louis Dangerously, and myself walking around Manhattan all day trying to find barbed wire. We actually found it on somebody's fence, and we run back, tell the musketeer who's on the ring group to run to this at this street, take a left here, there's barbed wire on a chain link fence. This fool goes somewhere else and finds razor wire. So you, the razor wire you see in the match is what he was supposed to be the barbed wire. He brings it back, and I told Tom, I said, you're not putting that on my face. I mean, it's crazy sharp. It's still like it was brand new. Yeah, yeah. So Tommy tells me before the match, if we have a good match, I'm going to shake your hand. You know, it's like a two warriors yeah. dueling it and, you know, shaking the, you know, the respect thing afterwards. So that whole that whole match, I wanted to have a great one. People were telling me beforehand, you know, I quit matches are hard to do. We hope you can pull it off, but we don't think you're going to be able to pull off a good match. And I was a driving force because I wanted to, you know, I wanted to tell people, hey, you know, I don't care what you sound, we'll put my name on the map. And I think what I remember most about that match was after the match, he shakes my hand. And if you if you have the DVD, go back and watch. And at the end of the match, they're recapping what we did. And if you listen, you can hear the fans chanting CF and Dub. They're chanting. I had, there's 3,000 people at the Hammerstein Ballroom. And I remember Tommy goes to the back. And I'm standing there selling, and they start, they all stand up, they all start giving me an applause and start chanting CF and Dub, CF and Dub. Yeah. It's like, they, you know, to me it was like I've made it. And they, the appreciation for the match I put on, and I'm walking to the back, and I'm, I'm literally looking around, these people chanting my name. And, you know, you, you're talking to a little guy that come from a community of yeah. less than 500 people that's yeah. got 3,000 people chanting for me. And I kind of got emotional, and I walked in the back. As soon as I go through the curtain, Bob Mahoney is standing there applauding. He's, and his words were, that is one of the best effing matches I've ever seen. And he hugs me, kisses me on the cheek, and I'm getting, like, high fives and hugs from everybody on the way back. So it's crazy. And the other thing that was memorable about that, it was January 7th, 2001, which happened to be my 30th birthday. Oh, wow. So two <laughs> It was, yeah. it was kind of, you know, it, the, the, the match, you know, we're talking about it 12 years later. Yeah. Um, it was happening with my third. You know, obviously, I did something, and I, I hear this all the time, that this, my I quit match and the Magnum TA Tilly Blanchard I quit match back from 85, I think it was, um, they called it the two greatest I quit matches. And the people that are watching don't go and base it on being a WWE fan and seeing the things they do. Go back and watch my I quit match and watch Magnum and Tillys and just expand your mind and you'll, you'll see. Um, you know, Tommy and I did another one last weekend. They were trying to rekindle it. And we got another one coming up. I think it was the best out of three. Yeah. It is now, so. Absolutely. And uh, let's say, when uh, ECW did close, what were your thoughts at the time when, uh, of course, ECW did close its doors? Uh, we were all in denial. I was, once I found out that we were done, I was depressed. We've been hearing that it was that we had money troubles and there were rumors that it was going to close. But I was like, man, this is ECW it can't close. You know, this company can't go out of business, and yeah. it didn't. Um, I went like an eight month depression spell because I fought so hard to make it in wrestling. And you know, like a month before, Paul had asked me if I was jumping ship at WCW. He heard I was going back to WCW, and I told him, you know, the rumors weren't true that I was loyal to him. Him and Tommy made me. Yeah. I was going to stay, you know, stick it out with them. And damn, man, I ended up getting getting screwed out of that deal. Yeah. But if they would have never closed, I'd never left. I'd still been in ECW. I loved it. It was like my second family and I hate it gone, man. And even when we do the reunion shows, I love doing them because again, I get to see yeah. my family, people that are really, really close to me. Absolutely. You know, you get that, it's that nostalgia. It's that reunion. It's that humbling feeling that you get every time you get to meet up with these people you know they are your second family and I think you know a lot of wrestlers always say them guys that they go on the road with to all these different towns you know you do you do you do build those bonds and uh, it's and so like when you're talking about your Omega family you know the same right there you know they're they're your second family so that's very nice to know um, the, 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 with the ECW family you know we were on the road four days a week and you know you're with your family three yeah. but you're with them four you're with them every morning because Every moment, because my traveling crew was myself, Jack Vickery, Steve Carino, Louis Dangerously, Dreamer, and Francine. Yeah. Even though they were the separate car, but it was us four. And man, we were like, you know, we were like that. Yeah. And we, you were literally with them every moment for, you know, four days a week, 24 hours a day. Yeah. And, it, you know, you learn, you fight like brothers, and, you know, uh, it, it, was, it was a great experience with them. 
Absolutely, and of course, when uh, ECW closed, you know, you weren't you weren't you weren't signed up to uh, WCW. You didn't go to the WWF to be a part of the uh, Alliance storyline at the time, because obviously they were bringing back. Well, they were signing a few guys to contracts, and they were trying to have like a little ECW thing run by Stephanie at the time. And because uh, you you went to WWE a little bit later on, it was two thousand and six, was it? 2006? Yes, two thousand and six. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. so I'm going to touch on that in a little bit. So let's talk about a few of the other things you did from leaving ECW. You know, you went back to the independents, and you went to uh, Ring of Honor. First of all, let's talk about Ring of Honor. Now, of course, you went to an early sort of Ring of Honor. From, okay, of course, ROH is still going right now, but the early right. Ring of Honor... Talk, yeah, different about, Ring of Honor. Yeah, totally different Ring of Honor. You want to talk me through that? Mm -hmm. um, the, the one that ran it was RF Video, Ronald Feinstein, Gabe Sapolsky, and, um, and Doug, I can't remember Doug's last name. He you know, passed away a few years ago. But um, they they got a few of us there, and, you know, asked us to come and do shows with them, and... Uh, um, I was, you know, I did shows, and I actually got heat with the booker because I, I took one of their bookings instead of, um, uh, I went to Japan instead of taking one of their bookings, and I was never asked back again. That was the early stuff of it. Oh, wow. Fair enough. I just want to thank C.W. Anderson for coming on the show this week. We've got him all over again next week for part two of this absolutely tremendous interview. But uh, that's about everything for this week, guys. My name is Ollie Harper. You have been watching the Gorilla Report. Keep on watching the professional wrestling. We will see you again next week, guys. Take care.